growing up, the fear of being gay was being effeminate. And it was more about not being a man. I never felt sexually comfortable in my skin. And that, I think, was exacerbated by the fact that I was not only recognizable, but had this very strange uh, nickname everywhere I went. <laughs> so it made me less of a raconteur to be called Doogie than be acne-ridden at a standard. I was in Rent with this incredibly diverse gaggle of people. Gay guys that are like, fuck you, this is who I am, snap, snap and straight guys that were super okay with gay people, and gay people that were super not okay with straight people, and that opened my eyes a lot. I thought, oh, wow, you can kind of be who you are and let the chips kind of fall where they may. So I wasn't really conscious of like, oh my God, if I come out, I'll never work again. I just wanted to make sure that I presented myself in a way that allowed me the most opportunity to work. <laughs> I do think that it's difficult for someone who's got a sibilant S, who's talking a lot, even if they're really masculine, if they're talking with like a hardcore lisp, it's hard for them to be the football quarterback in a movie. I got on a TV show, How I Met Your Mother, and I figured that's interesting because I'm playing like a very, very overt heterosexual on that show. I met David Burtka in New York. I was walking down the street one day. A friend, Kate Rinders, who's with this James Deeney looking dude. And I was like, Kate, nice job with this one. And she's like, David? Oh, no, he's totally gay. And I said, really? <laughs> we started dating very quickly, actually. And um, like a nice lesbian couple moved in after like three months. And uh, we sort of have never been apart. I don't think that kids need a father and a mother necessarily. I think they need male and female role models, but I don't think that means that we shouldn't have kids because we're two guys. We don't encourage our child to only play with Barbies, but if our son picks up a Barbie doll and wants to play with it, well, okay. Parents need to be more accepting of who their kids are and less concerned about who society thinks they need to be. It's such an interesting time now, I think, because the gay visibility is so prevalent. You can watch The Amazing Race and see a gay couple fight, argue, and win. General, normal, mainstream, middle America that doesn't get out and witness a lot of diversity. I feel like they get that diversity through television. Now there are so many examples that you can't just put the gay in the little gay box anymore. I was kind of a dreamer growing up. I would write about, you know, when I would have long hair and write about <laughs> laying in the grass and talking to a boy and doing things that I think my peers took for granted. And so I always knew that I would be a writer in New York City um, telling stories as a woman. I was named after my father. His name was Charles. I was his first son, so therefore I was his namesake. And I think that always frustrated him a bit because he wanted his son to be very tough. I can't remember a time when I didn't know that I was a girl wanting to always be in the kitchen with my aunts and my grandmother and hearing them talk about the world and talk about, you know, women's problems and gossiping about other women. I didn't hear the term transgender, transsexual. I didn't know what trans was. I remember in the seventh grade coming up to my mother and telling her, Mom, I'm gay. Just like any other person, I confused gender and, and sexuality. But I quickly realized that no, I was always meant to be a girl and I just happened to have the wrong equipment. When puberty hit, I was a late bloomer. I could see like a burgeoning Adam's apple and I could see, you know, a bit of peach fuzz. The reflection that's showing to me doesn't look like the person that I have always seen myself as. I 
was so lucky and so blessed in the fact that I had support at home. And I started the process just through my endocrinologist. At 18, I had already fully transitioned. Trans people, the T and the LGBT, I think there's a sense inherently within us, we want to blend in. After transitioning, I just wanted to live a normal life as just another girl in the crowd. But I think after a while, I kind of felt as if I was hiding something. And I was so blessed in my life. I had parents who loved me and a family who loved me. And I had great teachers who believed in me. And I don't think that I had all of those things dropped into my life to live silently. I overcame all of those things for a reason, to tell kids that you are beautiful and that nothing is unusual or strange about you because you're gay or lesbian or transgender or genderqueer, or however you want to express yourself, that nothing is wrong with you. We've had many, many victories and celebrations for our gay brothers and lesbian sisters, but we can't ignore the fact that transgender people are casualties in this fight. The federal government does not protect us from discrimination when we're trying to apply for a job or keep our job. I see kids who are transitioning. They're going to grow up and be able to say, I'm trans, just the same way that their, their gay and lesbian counterparts can say, I'm gay, I'm lesbian. I met a 14-year-old girl who told me that she wanted to be a writer like me someday. She didn't say she wanted to be as pretty as me. I knew she was transgender, but she, that's not what she connected with. She just connected with the writing. She had such a strong sense of self. I want to be a writer like you someday. I grew up in San Antonio, Texas. My family's military and Mormon. We'd go to church every single Sunday. One Sunday, they beamed in the president of the church, Spencer W. Kimball, and his message was that homosexuality is sin. I knew he was talking about me, and so my first impression of my own sexuality, my own love, was that it was a sin comparable to murder. I was a closeted gay kid in the 80s. I knew my sexuality. One day, I went to the video store. I think I was 13. I saw a movie that I was like, I have to have this movie. This movie was called The 400 Blows. And it was not what I was hoping it would be at all. It was actually, uh, you know, Francois Truffaut's masterpiece. It was a film about a real family that was troubled and a kid and how he deals with it. I had no idea that cinema could be reflective of my own life. It did change me and it made me feel less alone in the world. And I thought, boy, I want to do something like that. The time between realizing I was gay and coming out, it was about 15, 16 years. I was probably 20, 21 years old, and I'd come home for Christmas, which is when it often happens. My mom is sitting on my bed, she, and we always did this. We'd stay up and talk all night long, and she starts railing against don't ask, don't tell. And it wasn't because uh, it wasn't inclusive enough. It's because how dare they allow gay people into the military, and she was really passionate about it. I wasn't ready to come out, but I started to cry. And she knew. She knew right then and there. Um, and it was a quick conversation. I mean, my mom is paralyzed from polio. She knows what it's like to be different and to be judged for being different. She showed up to the Academy Awards wearing a white marriage equality ribbon. I have heard some filmmakers say they don't want to be labeled as a gay filmmaker. I am a gay filmmaker. I'm a gay guy. I'm not ashamed of that. I'm pretty proud of that, in fact. Being a gay filmmaker helps you see other people and their differences and to have empathy for what their differences do to their character. I'm not going to run from that label. I had campaigned for Obama in Nevada and in Virginia. To see him get up there and to give that speech, a speech where he, he said the word gay and lesbian, we were a part of this new vision. I went on laptop and just started refreshing the results coming in on Prop 8. It became increasingly clear we weren't gonna make it. And that in California, we were left out of the dream. 
I just remember thinking, boy, you know, what about that kid out there in San Antonio, Texas right now who tunes in and sees, sees the next day that gay and lesbian people had had their rights stripped away in California. They are still second class, they're still less than, and I know all too well the dire solutions that may have flashed through that kid's head. You know, those messages are dangerous. I think that that re election result cost lives. I do, so I was heartbroken. I'm sorry. Every day we don't have full equality. Every day those messages are still being sent. The gay and lesbian people are second class in this country. Uh, that more gay and lesbian kids are getting bullied. My hope is that we win this fight much faster than, than many think we can. I want to be out of the business of civil rights fighting as soon as possible. I grew up in San Antonio. Everybody lived in certain areas. The Hispanics lived over here, the Anglos lived over here, the African-Americans lived over here. And, and so in order for me to go to college, somebody said, you have to bus yourself across town to go to those high schools over there. It took me a while to realize why I was the only one with dirty shoes when it rained. The other neighborhoods had sidewalks and paved streets while our barrio did not. That was the first realization that we were different. It would have been very difficult for me to accept my sexuality if I hadn't made the connection with spirituality. I read an article about something called MCC, Metropolitan Community Church. And, I, and, and just like every other person that ever tried to come in there, we drove around the church for a couple of times trying to, trying to get brave enough to come in. I think I teared through the whole service, but as at the end, they always serve communion. And right in front of me, as we were lining up, was a gay couple with two little girls. And I guess I must have said it out loud, but I said, oh my God, where have you been? And the woman right in front of me turned around and said, we've been here waiting for you. God made it possible for me to see that in order for me to accept who I was. In 2004, Dallas County was very Republican, was very um, conservative, and, and here you have a female, Hispanic, lesbian Democrat running for sheriff. In the primaries, all but myself were men. The rumor mill started going, you know, we might have a woman sheriff. <laughs> we might have a lesbian sheriff. One of the state legislators gave me some very good advice. She said, don't let that be the first thing that comes out about you. Let them hear about your career and your standards and who you are. Dallas County was Republican, but in spite of that, they were able to see past the party lines. They were able to see past the, the sex lines. This person appears to be the best candidate. Right after I got elected, I got on a flight. Somebody sat next to me who said, are you Lupe Valdez? And I remember going, oh no, here we go. Why is this woman talking to me? She's Anglo, she's well-to-do, and she's probably Republican. And then she says, my son is gay. And I went, okay. And I said, tell me about your son. He went to the high school where her husband coached. He was not out. And they were so scared that he was gonna commit suicide because he was so depressed. And how's your son now? She said, oh, he's wonderful. He came out to us and he and his partner live down the street from us. They go to college and once a week they come over and have a meal with us. She says, I have to take your picture. My son will never believe that I sat next to you. With your election, you validated my son. You know, and I wanted to scream. Why can't we just get validated? for being human beings and being who we are. We need to, to, to make sure that it's okay to be who we are. Sports was my life. I was the biggest Deion Sanders fan. I mean, I had a shrine in my room. I had life-size posters. I had about 50 Deion Sanders football cards. I was obsessed with Deion Sanders. 
I grew up very religious. I went to church probably three to four times a week. No one ever specifically ever told me that being gay was wrong, but I remember my family and friends just having some very negative conversations. I knew instantly that who I was was never gonna be accepted, whether it was in my family or whether it was on the football field or whether it was with my friends. My dream was to play in the NFL. There was nothing that was gonna stop me. The idea that I could be gay and a sports player didn't match because the image of a gay man was always effeminate. I deemed myself as masculine. I was a man's man, you know, I like sports. I talk shit, you know, and every man that, uh, that I knew that was per perceived as gay, they sang in the choir, they played with girls. I didn't do any of those things, so I had a hard time trying to reconcile who, who I was with who they, they were. I was in the gym, and this gentleman is doing this stupid machine called the Gravitron. He was everything I thought I wanted in a guy. He was straight acting. He was totally passable. Um, he liked sports. We never had a discussion that we were dating or in a relationship. It was just one of those things where one day we're sitting in the car and we and our hands touched. There was this budding relationship. And then when I had to go over to NFL Europe, I had to figure out a way to talk every day. I would literally have my teammates in the room, but I would refer to him as if he was a girl. I became the world's greatest liar. I was in a city called Seaches. And if anyone knows Seaches, it is the second highest gay populated place in the world. And I had no clue of that. So I remember we arrived there and I'm like, there are a lot of men here in Speedos with their shirts off. And I was thinking to myself, God is punishing me. But I had never told anyone that I was gay until I stopped playing, playing football. It's impossible to talk to your mother every single day and have this secret that she doesn't know about. And at that time, I had a partner of two years. You know, he was being sick of being called Stephanie, too. Um, so, so I flew home, and we went for a walk. And I said, Mom, I have something to tell you. And she said, what? Like, she had no clue. I was like, I'm gay. And her first words were, you know, that's an abomination, don't you? I know that's, that's what you think. And her second thing she said was, you're already black. I still love you, and we'll work through this, but I just need time. I thought about telling, lying to her saying, I'm not gay, like that was just a phase because I had been living with the pain and I seemed to be okay. So I didn't want her to have to go through the same pain too. So I contemplated going back in the closet for a very long time. If a major league player came out, it really changes the conversation of what it means to be a masculine man. If we wait until every athlete says, I'm fine with someone being gay, the world will end. You know, so I think that we have to just push the boundaries now. It is much easier to be a gay man in the Republican Party than it is to be a Republican in the LGBT community, which tends to be predominantly left-leaning politically, will say, how do you deal? Oh my God, it must be such a burden. You must be, it must be such great pain to be moving in conservative circles. As a person of faith, I have more in common with fellow conservatives. Growing up in a place like Tallahassee, Florida, it was very much similar to earlier generations. We had sock ops, bonfires, white-tailed deer hunting. We were Eagle Scouts. Growing up, anybody that would be identified as gay uh, would, be, would fall into a certain stereotype. The man that did my mother's hair at the salon, uh, the florist. As a Christian, I spent a lot of time praying that it would go away. That said, I was very blessed to have a godparent, my Uncle Larry. My parents had to sit down and explain Uncle Larry's roommate was actually his partner. So I already had, very early on, a positive role model. I do credit Uncle Larry to saving my life. I realized my orientation is a gift from God just as much as the orientation of my heterosexual brother is his gift from God. The Law Cat Republicans were the LGBT group of the Republican Party. The federal suit filed by Law Cat Republicans that challenged the federal statute, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, you know, banning gay and lesbians from serving in the military. Yes, President Obama signed the bill, but we put that bill on his desk. When I actually took the job 
to run Log Cabin Republicans. One member from Texas asked me, you know, when did you become a gay? We were having the conversation of, is it a choice? Is one's orientation a choice? And that's when I realized how, how not only important our, our institutional role was, but that it was incumbent upon us to educate lawmakers. If people come out, if family, friends, neighbors, and staff members come out, they can't ignore these issues if they are constantly reminded or surrounded by people that they respect and love who happen to be LGBT or T. Drag pushes my adrenaline button. I love to go out in drag because you can make an entrance and you can go up to the cutest boy in the club and grab him by the crotch, which I would never dream of doing if I were not in drag. So drag queens can get away with murder. The first time I was in drag, I was a snake charmer. I've charmed a few snakes since then. <laughs> I was in love with I Dream of Jeannie, Barbara Eden. In the first grade show, my mom made me that outfit and I wore cat eye, you know, 60s eye makeup. Even though everyone knew that I was a sissy, somehow I got over. I was attending Georgia State. RuPaul and I were backup dancers for a group called The Now Explosion. He got us a gig and we headed up to New York. The club was drag queen owned and operated. These were drag queens out of the mainstream and you really felt like you were part of a scene that was unique. Drag queens fronting bands like Tanya Ransom or doing plays like Ethel Eichelberger or taking lip syncing and, and making it an art form as Lip Synca did. Wigstock was born one night when the pyramid closed and we were not ready to stop drinking. We grabbed 40 ounces and went to Tompkins Square Park. We just thought of an idea of how about parodying Woodstock with a festival of wigs and rock. And I think the idea would have faded with the next day's hangover had I not actually sought out the permits. At its peak, we were getting 30 to 45,000 people. Not just the performers came in costumes, there were amazing creative people in New York at that time. One of the big breakthroughs in drag was RuPaul's success, because here for the first time you had a drag queen who was saying, I am gorgeous and I am glamorous in some like it hot or Milton Berle or Mrs. Doubtfire or Tootsie. There's always an excuse for them to have to be hiding in drag. They don't want to do drag. I never understand why feminists have a problem with drag queens. There are some things that drag queens do like rub imaginary boobs or portray, as I guess I do, um, a tacky woman. The thing is, I'm not trying to be a woman. I'm using women's clothing in rather large sizes. <laughs> <laughs> to express who I think I am. That has nothing to do with the woman. This is about me and how I want to dress. Do gay kids value their predecessors? No, I don't think that they do. Don't you ever discount the drag queens. I get so tired of these conservative gays always saying the leather men and the drag queens, that doesn't represent our community. We started your gay rights. It was not the conservative gays that put on a pink t-shirt or a rainbow flag one day a year and then went back to their closeted office jobs. It was the drag queens and the street people that were getting the harassment by the police that said, uh-uh, enough, here's a brick in your fucking face. Everything changed in July 1981 with the announcement of what would be called AIDS. I helped to start two major organizations, Gay Men's Health Crisis and ACT UP. 
On the one hand, so many of our friends were dying, and on the other hand, we slowly had a small army of people who were working so very hard to save the rest of us. It was during that time that I realized, number one, how truly proud I am that I am a gay man and how truly wonderful I think gay people are. I found that with AIDS, the Times wasn't writing about us, nobody was writing about us, the mayor wasn't answering phone calls. It was awful. People would rush up to me and say, have you heard of anything? Is there anything coming along? You know, I don't think I'm going to be able to last much longer. For many years, there wasn't anything, and you had to say to them somehow, hold on, hold on, and give each other hugs. And ACT UP made itself. We began every meeting by announcing who had died since the last meeting. And boy, if that wasn't enough to keep you going, I don't, I don't know what. The first meeting had 200, the next meeting had three. We had a demonstration that following week on Wall Street, several thousand showed up and we were born. It got more radical as we went on and we decided to have a, a protest at St. Patrick's. We had all been trained in civil disobedience and it was very carefully choreographed what we were going to do. Like all good actors, these guys and gals really got into their parts. They faced the altar and yelled at him, stop murdering us. Cardinal Connor was having a fit. We were crucified ourselves the next day and on. Every major network, every major newspaper said the most awful things about ACT UP, how terrible we were destroying people's right to worship. And people were scared. What are we gonna do? They hate us. And I said, no, they don't. They're afraid of us. This is the best thing we have ever done. We're no longer just limp-wristed fairies. We're guys in jeans, in Levi's and in boots. We're here, we have voices, and we're gonna fight back. It made us that action at St. Patrick's. Every treatment for HIV that is out there is out there because of us. Not from the government, not from any politician, not from any drug company. We forced all of those things into being by our anger and our fear. And that's what anger can get you. You do not get more with honey than with vinegar. Anger is a wonderful emotion. Very creative, if you know how to do it. I really truly felt that for some reason I've been spared to tell this story. Everybody I know is dead. All my friends, I shouldn't say everyone, but almost. I'm still here. Okay, thank you, God. I don't believe in you, but thank you anyway. <laughs> this is what I'm gonna do to pay back. When I was young, I remember having a crush on a girl who had a crush on my brother. I just looked up her and I said, I said you know, I, I, I wish I were a boy because then, then you would want to be my girlfriend. And she let go of my hand and she was like, no, no, you're a girl and you like boys and that's it. And don't ever say that again to anyone. I felt like something was wrong with me and that was the moment when I said, oh, okay, that's right, I like boys. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, I like boys. I was living as a, a straight woman. Uh, I would say, you know, a, a good wife. When the marriage ended, for other reasons, it was it, it was very liberating. Then something like went off and said, well, I tried that. It didn't work out. Let's get some pussy. A lot of African-American culture is embedded with the church. That's another reason why it took me so long to, to deal with, you know, my sexuality. I go by, by what I, I read from the Bible. And as Jesus said, 
Above all these things, love thy neighbor as thyself. It'd be really easy to love everyone if they were all like you. You make everybody different. And he's like, this is, the, this is gonna be the hardest shit for y'all to do, is to love each other. That's gonna be the hardest thing. He's probably just sitting laughing, just going, I knew they, I knew they was gonna mess this up. Instead of saying, saying what not to do, I try to live by what he says to do. Love, yeah. When I came out, it wasn't planned at all. It was a national day of protest against the passage of Prop 8. I said, okay, where's the rally? I, we, you know, we're gonna go to the rally. And I did, in my speech, I said, hey, you know, I, you know, I got married and um, this, you know, I, I'm, I'm pissed. I get to the hotel, I'm you know, turning TV, and on CNN scroll, it's, you know, comedian Wanda Sykes, I'm proud to be gay. And I was like, oh, this is a big fucking deal. I'm a black woman, a celebrity, and I'm out. It was a big deal. No regrets. I grew up watching a lot of comedy. Our whole family would just sit there watching TV and, and, and laugh. One who really stayed with me was Jackie Moms Mabley. She was the first black woman that I saw doing stand-up. My comedy, it has to come from a real place, so it would be hard for me not to talk about my sexuality. And a lot of them talking about my wife and my kids. What's funny is that I would get off stage and someone would say, you know, um, I really thought you were hilarious and all, but you didn't really make a statement for, for like gay rights. I'm like, jackass, I just did a whole fucking hour about my wife and kids. You can't get any gayer than that. What the fuck? You know, what? I, I, my life says it. My life is a, is a speech for equality and a speech for, hey, we, we all are going through the same problems. Different sex, but same shit, same problems. I started working in New York City as a housing organizer, and I met now State Senator Tom Duane. He asked me to run his 1991 campaign to be the first openly gay city council member and first openly HIV positive elected official in the country. So I took that job. And Tom would go around introducing me to everybody as his straight campaign manager. And he thought it was the funniest thing that he had this straight campaign manager for this big gay campaign. The months running that campaign, it was when it became clear to me that this idea that I could be professionally successful, I could have friends, I could be happy, but I didn't need a romantic life and would never have one was going to be an untenable way to live. I said, I really need to talk to you about something important. And he said, oh my God, you're going to quit. And I said, no. And he said, oh, what are you, a lesbian? Oh, we don't really have time for that. That's fine. Let's go. I don't really know why the Republicans are using such hideous and mean anti-gay rhetoric. The idea that you have to lift yourself up by pulling other people down it's just not nice, and I don't understand why you would want to be on the international stage and behave in a way that your mother would have told you isn't nice. Your mother told you not to pick on people. We can pretend words don't matter, but words do matter. Marriage is a word that is universally recognized. Everybody knows the literal definition of it and the societal definition of it. And if you say, I can't get married, everybody knows what that means, too. It means the law is not with and for and about you. To say all these other families can have that, but you have to have this other thing that we had to create that nobody heard of until we came up with it and isn't as good as the real thing that's been around since they made dirt, you're left out. Marriage passed in New York State after it failed. In 2009, there was a vote and we lost. And we lost bad. What was great about 2011 is we won with diverse support. We had a letter from business leaders, from Lloyd Blankfein, the head of Goldman Sachs. I don't think he was ever a Queer Nation member, you know what I'm saying? He signed a letter with other huge business leaders asking the state Senate to do this. Two days after marriage passed was the Pride Parade. I got to march with Governor Cuomo and it was, you really weren't marching, you were kind of like floating down. I don't know that I've ever seen such unadulterated joy. If you had asked people 10 years ago, would in 2011 uh, New York State pass marriage equality? If you told them Massachusetts, 
Connecticut, all these other states had it, they would tell you you were nuts. We have succeeded beyond anything we could have dreamt of. You're not allowed, really, to have that much success and to squander it. You have to harness it and use it. Part of me does feel happier that gay culture is kind of normalizing, and then the other side, it makes me sad a little bit too. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. There's something I love so much about, about being a homo, and I feel like anybody that's gonna be wagging their finger at us, it's like, you know, fuck, who cares, fuck off. In high school, I would go see this band called The Cramps. The singer's name was Lux Interior. And he would come out in a black rubber smock and like lady slacks and pumps, not too high, and totally just freak the fuck out, blowjobbing the microphone. And, you know, I don't know if he was ever gay or not, but he was like the queerest thing I had ever seen. That energy was what I wanted to give on stage. The first few years, all the media, they're always calling us a gay band. It used to really dishearten me. Growing up, there'd be like the Christian Cindy Lauper or, you know, the Christian George Michael. Always being called a gay band was that it was like the gay version of something real. Um, I don't feel that way anymore. The last couple years, I started really writing music about being gay, my take on, on gay life in the past and the present people like Freddie Mercury, Elton John in those early years, George Michael, they were still having to hold in the person that they really were. I just think that would be so miserable. I can't imagine going out on stage and, you know, shaking around and doing my high kicks, you know, and giving some, I don't know how I could do it, and at the same time, not talk about my sexuality. The year that I came out, there were these phone lines that you would call, and there were these chat rooms. Every once in a while, we'd have little parties where we would all get up and get together and meet each other, and you'd see these people that you were talking to on the phone, and it was really a freak show. Talk about outsiders. I mean, these were proper outsiders. But it kind of felt like a, a family. I met this woman on this chat line, and we talked a lot on the phone, and we started becoming friends. She was really obese and she had a, a problem getting around. She had a problem being in public. People would make fun of her. And so we, we made this pact that, that if I ever made any money, uh, I would, I, we would get her gastrointestinal bypass surgery. Um, so we started making music and I, I wrote this song for her called Mary. Her name was Mary. We got the surgery for her and it, it ended up killing her. She was probably the most important person in my life as far as a friend. Being on the outside gives you an incredible perspective and changes you as a, as a person and makes you have different ideas about what you see. Um, I wouldn't give that up for the world. Around six or seven, my parents told me about heaven and hell. And in the same breath, they said, you're not allowed to have a boyfriend. And when the time comes, we'll pick the, the man for you. We'll, you know, we'll introduce you to him. And my parents did their best to sort of straddle both cultures, like being Afghan. In the summer, going to mosque and learning to read the Quran. And we only spoke Farsi or daddy at home. And then also doing things like ballet and soccer and, you know, like block parties and those sort of things. Being queer or being gay or lesbian was never an option in our family. But I do remember seeing men and women at family functions dancing together. You know, men dance with men, women dance with women. I wonder if I could get away with being queer under the guise of we're just a very homosocial culture. I should have girlfriends. I think I was like 14 when I came out to myself. I'm queer, I'm, I'm gay. That's sort of the way that I think straight people just know they're straight. It was like, oh, that's what I acknowledged. 
I think it's important for us to reclaim words. Queer is one of those words that's traditionally been used in a really negative and derogatory way. It pushes me to think outside of the binary. There aren't just female and male. There is so much more diversity um, in, in each being. I went away to college in 2000, and I never said to my parents, I'm not coming back. It's not a reality in my family. It's not a reality in my culture for a woman to not live at home. Like, you leave home when you go to the next man's home, which is your husband. And in the end, I had to be really honest about all the things I wasn't telling them about. I wasn't telling them about my relationship. I wasn't really explicit about my sexual orientation. And so I wrote them this like long nine page letter. I went home to visit my parents one weekend. My dad said like, come with me to the supermarket. We should help me buy groceries. And so he did that thing where he like turned off the radio and he's like, I got your letter. I haven't shown it to your mom and I'm not going to. We're gonna figure this out together. You're already a double minority. You're a woman in this country. You're an Afghan. You come from refugee parents. You don't have to prove anything. Don't live this life of struggle. But if you wanna come out about it, just know I will not be, ba be buried in Afghanistan. To think about jeopardizing his integrity, his dignity, and his honor um, is a frightening and a very shameful, upsetting place to be. But I also know where my resilience comes from is from that same man and from that same woman. I'm out to all my students. Having out invisible LGBT teachers, it offers a young person this idea of, I can make it. If you did it, I can do it too. That will do so much for a young person and that does so much for what that young person can offer our world. I don't want to be on television just to talk to the Kardashians. They're lovely people, but I mean, I'd like to actually make a difference while I'm here too. I have a forum where I can say things that are important. My hope for the future is, I hope those low rise jeans go out of style. Someone's got to put an end to that. Because when you bend over, your ass is hanging out and that's not right. When I was doing stand up, I was traveling around in a lot of small towns and a lot of cities where I wouldn't have been accepted at all as a gay comedian. As my career uh, progressed and I was on television, then certainly I couldn't come out because you have all these people around you that help you stay closeted. They're making money off of you and, and as long as you know they know, I'm not really closeted, I'm out, I'm just not out to the world and it's nobody's business and you can justify that all you want. But the reality is you're still a slave to it. You're still, it's a heaviness that you live with inside. There's a fear that someone's not gonna like you because of this thing. When I realized that I, I couldn't keep that secret anymore, I decided I would come out and my character would come out on the show. I was celebrated for a short time. It was a big deal. And then it was a, a horrible deal. I lost my show and I lost my career and I lost a lot, but I was able to be completely free. It's just amazing to me that kids grow up around other gay kids now because I always felt like I was different. I just didn't know that I was different in the way that I was gay. I was a girl who didn't really like to wear dresses. I'm very much a family person. I like the idea of a home and a partner. Growing up, I never thought that I would ever meet somebody. On my wedding day, I was feeling happier than I've ever been in my entire life. I'm marrying someone, I'm getting married. I'm not civil unioning anybody. We have this amazing connection that I, I never thought I'd find with anybody. The more that we have people that speak up, the more that we have people that are seen in positions of power, the more that these people who just are ignorant to the fact they're gonna go, oh, I know someone who's gay. We just need to be a, a, a little more visible. We need everybody. We need athletes and we need artistic people. We need quiet people. We need shy people. We need weird people. Some people get picked on because they're too good looking. I know that. I want it to be a, a, a gentler world. It's, it's harsh and it's hard and it's cruel sometimes. And, and it's, um, I want it to be a better world. I 
I grew up on the south side of Chicago, inner city, the hood. I had a speech impediment. I couldn't pronounce my R's, S's, or T's. I knew I was stupid. I knew I would never be anything. The entire class knew that. So I never, ever really tried. I was a waitress for seven years, making $400 a month. So I go to interview for a job. This was 1980, and affirmative action was in full bloom. They didn't have any women stockbrokers at the time. Now, I'm not somebody who wears dresses or skirts. I don't feel comfortable in it. So I get dressed in my red and white Sassoon pants, tucked into my white cowboy boots with this blue silk shirt. Are y'all getting the picture? And go in to Merrill Lynch. And nobody knows what to do with me. And before I know it, I'm in the manager's office. Here I am now, a stockbroker at Merrill Lynch. And I'm sitting in a sales meeting. It's all these male brokers and me. And the manager is up there. He says, men, I want you to listen to me. The first time you ever sell a private limited partnership, it will be better than the first time that you... I looked at him and I said, were you going to say the first time you mm, a woman? And he said, yeah. And I go, I get that. I get that by not judging them. They didn't judge me. I've been able to acquire a serious sum of money. But here is what's going to happen. Upon my death, any money that I leave to KT, the love of my life, that is then above the estate tax limit, she's going to lose essentially half of all the money that I'm leaving to her and I'm gonna lose whatever she leaves to me. If we could be legally married on a federal level, any money a spouse leaves to another spouse, it could be $10 billion, they can leave it to each other estate tax free. That's how it works for heterosexuals. And it's not just about estate tax. I'm in Chicago, I'm giving a talk for 5,000 women, and I'm not feeling good. When we're going to the hospital, KT's saying, who am I gonna tell them I am? I know, I'll tell them I'm your sister. No, KT, you're gonna tell them you're my spouse. And she says, no, Susie, I'm afraid. I'm afraid if I tell them that, they won't let me in. Really, we have to lie to be by the sides of the ones that we love? At the time that KT has seen me suffer, that she should feel like she can't just be there as who she is and she has to pretend that she's somebody she's not, it's just so wrong. We spent many years in South Africa, a country that's gone through apartheid, that's oppressed more people maybe than anybody. Gay marriage is legal. In fact, it's so legal that there's really no difference at all between gay marriage, straight marriage, any of it. Where is it honored? Everywhere in the world, Susie, except the United States of America. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? So, KT and I were married legally in South Africa. I hold up that marriage certificate every once in a while and I look at it and I think to myself, Maybe, just maybe one day, we're gonna be able to get married on a federal level again. Because what a heartbreak. South Africa recognizes me, but the United States of America doesn't. What does that say? There was always a feminine side to me. I was pulled into someone's office at my church, and um, someone said to me that if I didn't change how I was, that I'd be asked to leave. God loves all, but you are telling me that because I'm this way, I can't be here. And that didn't click in my mind. It still doesn't make sense to me. I've been a part of the mainstream bar since, since 2004. I was 14. The bar scene started around 1880. 
It later evolved around 1960-something, um, where the Harlem drag ball circuit arose. Paris is Burning was definitely an epic film for our community. People started to understand what is a ball, what are the categories, what happens there, what is a house. A house is called a house because it takes on the structure of a family, but with no respect to gender. I have a butch queen mother, a femme queen mother, and a butch queen father. If you've been rejected by your biological family, right, or you've been kicked out or shunned, whatever the case may be, and you have this surrogate family, ballroom is a competition, but a house is more than just a competition. That house is a real family. Gender and sexual orientation is very fluid within the ballroom scene. A butch queen would be a, a gay male. That's our way in the ballroom scene or in, um, of saying a gay male, a butch queen. So I'm a butch queen, but someone who's a post-op trans woman has a vagina, so she considers herself a woman who's attracted to man, which technically is heterosexual. So it, it really is how, how you choose to identify yourself. My parents split when I was in the seventh grade, and so from that point on, I was raised in a single family home. I had to work, I had to be in school, as my mother did an amazing job raising me, but being that other half to raise myself, that it's provided me the experience that I'm able to do that for other people. When I moved to New York in 2007, I thought it was to escape from Virginia, to go into the fashion industry and go to FIT and work fashion week and do this stuff. And in actuality, my purpose was to move up here to do what I'm doing now, to help the people who don't have anybody else to turn to. As a community health specialist, I do HIV testing, connection to treatment and care, which means I myself go with them to their first doctor's appointment. I myself go with them to make sure they get insurance. I'm my mother's only child. I had an honest conversation with her saying that, you know, either you accept me for all of who I am or you get none of me. And my mother took all of me. And I'm 30, Twiggy Poochie Garçon. Um, it's the same person, just with more life experiences. And um, I still be helping people. That's never gonna change. There are a lot of people who really don't believe people when they say they're bisexual. So I try and avoid the bisexual label because it just brings so much grief down on you. People think you're faking, you're wishy-washy, or people think you're um, a sex addict or something who doesn't want to make up their mind. I want to be a political fighter and I want to be in there fighting, so I call myself gay. And certainly I'm like delighted to be in the gay club. People all the time talk about, you know, when I came out, well, I don't feel like I came out. I feel like I fell in love with someone and that person was a woman and I don't want to minimize that in any way. What I'm attracted to about Christine is her butchness and her gayness, but I don't feel like all of a sudden there was a part of me that had been, you know, denied or living in the shadows that finally could come out. Gay people are fighting really, really hard for our civil rights. What's important is the world looks at all of us and sees us as gay, and so we need to be cohesive and we need to fight as one community. Marriage equality is so much the right issue for me to kind of pin my hat on because after years of being in love with a man and everybody badgering us to get married, all of a sudden I was in love with a woman that I actually wanted to marry and I wasn't allowed to. In a society where there are two different sets of rules for different kinds of people, you're immediately sending a message that th those people that don't have those rights, they're somehow lesser and they're not really full citizens and they're not maybe even really human. You're sending a message to the worst elements in society. If you wanna, you know, find someone to pick on, this is a good, this is a good group because the government's not gonna protect them. Being out, how will that affect you being cast in things? It's very difficult to gauge. You don't really know about the parts you didn't get cast in. I was offered three roles in a row just now that were all lesbian roles. My daughter, who's 16, was saying to me, how do you feel about that? Do you feel like all of a sudden you're now being typecast? 
My daughter is Jewish and she's being raised Jewish. And I was like, you know, it's, it, it's, it's very similar. It's like, as a Jewish performer, you can complain, why do I always get the Jewish roles? We gotta embrace those roles and we gotta play those roles. Now that we're married, there is a way that people see us and treat us that is different. Somehow, once we were married, they understood us as a family in a way that they hadn't before. I am not a particularly religious person, but I am somewhat religious. The left in general have made a, a terrible mistake ceding religiosity to, to the right. Bishop Jean Robinson, who performed Christine in my wedding ceremony, said when America was founded, and we said we, we had a very particular bunch of people we were talking about, white, male, property holders. And gradually, the we became larger and larger. So then it was white men and black men who had been freed by that point. And then gradually it was opened up to include women. Gay people are, are kind of the, almost the final frontier. This is what the gay rights movement is about, saying that I as a gay person am part of we. It can't be us and them anymore. We have to understand um, we're all us. Thank you.